Hey, y'all. I have a such a good long-term friend of mine that I am really pumped to be able to bring you today. We haven't had a whole lot of men on the show yet. And this is, we are going deep on automation today. So I have brought with me the powerhouse for automation. So if I'm going to go, I'm going big and we are going to go hefty. And so we are going with the king of automation, in my opinion, which is Austin Moorhead with Lava Automation. Austin, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. So flattering. <laughs> well, I am super excited because I think you and I have known each other. I'm going to say what, since 2018, 2017? Yeah, 20, 2018, I think. Yeah. yeah. I was a broker at the time. Yeah. So you were in the insurance proper space on this and yeah. the sales and, and all of that kind of space. And we actually connected through a, another group that was really into like Facebook marketing and online lead generation yeah. and there was some technology involved with some of that. So super excited that Frank I group, to be able yeah. to be a part of that group with you. But yeah. as we're here on the podcast today, tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get into automation technology and all that, even with an insurance background? Yeah, I uh, started off at State Farm. We'll go over this quick. And uh, it wasn't a 30 year <laughs> career for me. So left there. And I realized that uh, I wanted to be a broker because I wanted, you know, market access. And I wanted to be able to use technology that captive carriers and a lot of ideas. Yep. And uh, so then I, you know, opened up a brokerage with a partner at the time. And, um, you know, it was kind of my job to figure out the technology. And, you know, in 2018, agencies generally wasn't on the scene, not like it is today. And mine wasn't on the scene like it is today. A lot of people are using things like uh, small business CRMs, like just generic CRMs that weren't yeah. specific to any industry. And Zoho, so we those. you know, some of those others yeah. that, are there, that are out there. Entreport, Keep, Hive Drive. I mean, there's got to be 50 of these things. Um, and so we picked up one of those and we built out like this insurance model. And I was talking to another agent in Denver and he goes, Hey, we use the same CRM. Do you mind building mine out? And I probably should have said no, but, uh, <laughs> you know, as, as, luck, as luck has it, I said, okay. And then I was like working till midnight and figuring this thing out and, you know, breaking stuff. And eventually we kind of put in 10,000 hours into keep and got really good at it. Wow. And, uh, that, that client, Mark Rogers, uh, I'm gonna throw his name out there. He went from. Uh, doing like a you know million and a quarter new business to seven million in new business within a few years, and he's done it over. Oh since. my goodness! And we're like, holy crap, we've got something here. Like we figured yeah. out kind of like the mousetrap, so to speak. And uh, um, I had the affair with automation, and I couldn't go back. So got rid of the <laughs> equity in uh, the other agency, and um, yeah. a few few months later, Mark said, "Hey, can I?" You also get us some VAs to kind of help us with some of the remarketing stuff. Today, we have 200 employees in the Philippines. That's crazy. Um, yeah, it's, it's been a, a wild, wild ride. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you officially focused in on automation, what, 2020? When did you officially make that change? Yeah, so I, I opened up Lava September 1st of 19. So we just okay. had our, uh, whatever, four-year anniversary a couple months ago. Thank you. Yeah. Yay. So on the automation side, we we automate about a half a billion in premium goes through our stuff wow. each year. Half a billion in premium. That's crazy. So, okay. So for those people who don't really know what Lava Automation is, because I'm just throwing it out there. We didn't, we haven't really gone back into that. We talked a little bit about how you got into automation and helping agencies with their automation, but tell me what Lava Automation specifically does. Yeah, uh, thanks. We uh, would help agencies uh, get their CRM stood up. You know, there's a lot of settings in there. And uh, the things that we learned in my first year of building the CRM, there was a lot of mistakes that were made. Uh, sometimes some of them very, uh, you know, catastrophic. You might send a te uh, email blast to, you know, 500 people that you didn't mean to do it to or something like that. And uh, then we didn't know what to say in the content. Right. We didn't know how long to run the content for. And we didn't have all the solutions for remarketing, you know, out the gate. And we couldn't figure out what we wanted to do with service in the system. And people weren't trained, I think, to use CRM very well. And so that we had some like hard adoption. But we went through all of that stuff, you know, and now we've, you know, shown agencies, I think probably 86 different agencies we've helped set up. Um, and we can get agencies up and running on a CRM in a few months. 
Yeah. Um, so this, and, and if you go back four or five years, you know, it could take an agency six months to, you know, kind of get acclimated or whatever, acclimatized to us here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So that's so, I, mean, I mean, I was actually talking to somebody this morning and we were talking about how I feel like I've come to this realization in my own mind that I think I'm a three quarters away gal. That's who I am. I would get in there. I will get dirty with you. I will learn. I will push. But then about half to three quarters of the way in, I get some shiny object and I just go a different direction. And then nothing ever gets truly completed. And um, I know that for my agency, we have we were on active campaign for a number of years, really enjoyed it, got it up and running. But like you said, there was like 10,000 hours. I mean, I didn't go 10,000 hours, but there was, say, I put in 100 hours of time that I just did not have to continue at that pace for being yeah. able to continually build out the program, right? I know that you've done a lot with Keep. I know a lot of people have done a lot with Keep. Um, part of the Infusionsoft uh, a suite of products, and that's a great product as well. And now I know a lot of people are doing um, Agency Zoom. A lot of people are doing Insured Mine. All yeah. of these other ones are out there. But I know that, especially for an agency owner, half the battle for me is knowing where I want to go, what I want to be able to accomplish, and then all those twists and turns of being able to figure out where we're going and what we're doing. And like you mentioned, those really big mistakes and the fear that goes along with it. What y'all are doing is taking all that off of the agency owner's um, uh, hands. So that way we can go do our, what we do best and y'all can really build out you know, that agency of the future. Yeah. Yeah. It's like uh, if you're going to compete with our quality of build standard that you'd have to put in the years that we have doing this. Mm -hmm. This is all we do. Um, and so well, you, know, it's like, you want to be an insurance agent here. or do you want to be a developer? If you want to be a developer, right. come talk to me and I'll give you a job. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're hiring, you're growing. I yeah, love it. We're, yeah, we're growing. I love it. I love it. So how do you, how do you normally open up those conversations with um, agency owners or people in the industry? Because I think technology is really scary for a lot of people. It's really scary for our teams. Our teams are set in ways that they normally operate. How do you guys kind of open up that conversation about automation and what automation can do for an agency? I think it kind of depends on what part of the industry you're in right now. So I think Vertifor users and now search users and uh, Hawksoft users, they have a, a deeper awareness, I think, of some of the tools and you know stuff out there. And so your the conversation just kind of starts a little bit deeper than yeah. like some of the applied users that are just kind of waking up potentially to um, the power of CRMs. And so it's like, well, well, a CRM is this to them and to us. We already know that it's going to do emails and texts. It's the conversation for us is like, when are they going to go? Yeah. You know, who's pushing the button and then how do we keep ourselves accountable? Like, you know, we're just at the next phase, I think in some of the other communities. Um, yeah. And so when I'm just talking to agency owners. I, I, uh, you know, I, I usually want to know like what their leads are, you know? So like, if we're going to build you a Ferrari, I want to know what, how much gas you're going to put in the tank. Yeah. Because we've got agencies that are doing a million a month, a new business premium. And it's like, I, you know, I really just kind of being around other agencies that want to push. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh, let's, let's buy leads. And, and so I, I think I'm often talking about lead data to agency owners. I'd like to go through reports um, and try and convince them to go buy internet leads. I'm the worst guy on the planet. I think they kind of, some of them get kind of look at me like, dude, you're the devil. <laughs> <laughs> we do not want to work internet leads. Eh, yeah, right. well, the data says you should. Wow. Um, there's just a lot of them out there that you could test. Not all of them are equal. Some of them are better than others. Right. Right. I think I like to we kind all of the push systems and the processes, you know, kind of back to that other conversation of what we were doing back in 2018 is the conversation of if you work a lead right based on where it comes from and what the client expects, you're going to have success. And it's also working it right goes so much further than that first 10, 20, 30 day conversation, it really goes into a longevity conversation. Cause I think what people don't do right about leads, and that wasn't my original point of being able to have you on to talk about leads, but is, is that it has to be a long, a long play. People think of leads as quick and down and dirty. You can sell and you're good in 30 days. And that's not the way that I think that it's supposed to be these days. Well, you can still, we definitely see that the average deal closes in under 30 days. Okay. But you're but you're gonna spend time chasing people potentially for a year or two. I mean, there's gonna be people that for whatever reason it didn't make sense this year, and we're gonna follow up next year. Like that is part of the game. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes, you know, uh it's not always next year, it's you know, in commercial, just give me four months, you know. 
right uh, we'll talk it, you know whatever it is the next renewal we can just catch up yeah, yeah. Uh, and so it's like how do you manage all of that well that's what a crm does you know so i love it i love it so you kind of got in you have that great insurance background you started working with agencies to be able to help them to be able to automate what do you find, we kind of talked about this a little bit as far as like the mentality of, of, of agencies. Do you find though that with today's hard market that agencies are starting to open up a little bit more than they have in the past to the idea of, or are they almost like clinching in and going, no, we can't handle anymore. Are they kind of going into, into that shock mode or are they going into that expansion mode? Because I think I'm seeing both out there in the yeah, same. space, like as far as conversations go, a lot of people are shrinking and nutting down to do what they do, which is great. And other people are going, no, we have to be a more expansive approach. What are you seeing out there in the industry? You know, my A players, you know, a year ago are still my A players today. Yeah. Um, and, you know, some of these people were writing a million dollars a month, a new business premium. Like they didn't slow down when the market went like this and they're getting hard markets and they're losing carrier after carrier. I've got, I mean, in Florida, this has been the theme for the last five years. Right. Um, the rest of the country is just waking up. And some of my Florida agencies, they haven't skipped a beat. Right. Uh, you know, they're just still moving as much as they were. And then, uh, I, I, but generally speaking, everyone I talk to, you know, they're losing four or five carriers and they're having to roll stuff. I think it's a good exercise and I think it's really going to promote the VA model. And I'm so it, selfishly, I'm like into that, like, yay. But the reality is, is, you know, you're just having to spend way more time filtering and way more time kind of like uh, hand holding it renewal to make sure that we're not, you know, getting our customers shopping. Yeah. But at the same time, we don't want to overload, I think, our assets there because the growth potential is so high because the whole country is stressed that people are shopping. You got these 20-year shoppers that have never been shopping, shopping. And and so I think the majority of people that we do meet are kind of like apprehensive because of the hard market and they're not focusing on new business. And they'll tell you, yeah, we got leads coming through the door and we can't keep up. It's like, well, you know, you need to be recruiting that, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because never have opportunities come to your agency ever. It's a business that you can't serve. So, you know, couple up to that pipeline and, and figure it out. Um, yeah. I think there's a lot of leads out there right now to be got. So, yeah. Yeah. No. And I, and I do agree with that. And the more people are out there shopping, looking, the more opportunity we have to be able to expand our book, maybe diversify. I mean, I always tell people that I think for me, the agency of the future, which is what I'm trying to build on my end, is a hybrid model of an agency, a personally owned agency with a larger scale big box company because people want the convenience they want the communication they want to know what's going on they want the immediacy of of service they want to know that they know that they know but then they also want to be able to pick up the phone a lot more and not have to go through a call center and they want to be able to so to me it's more about bridging that gap of being that small town agency with a large uh, technology stack and a large uh, ability to be able to deliver the immediacy and the convenience that I think a lot of consumers are looking for with the concept of markets and um, and all that. So um, I think for me, that is part of the shift in the insurance space is that we do have to level up in order to be able to stay relevant because our markets are getting harder. We don't have this massive volume right like some of these big box carriers do who might be like geico it, it, they broker out the homeowner side of things right so they have lots of different carriers for that well they may not have those carriers um to some degree you know cut 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 commissions or they may not have as many challenges because they're such a big they have a different type of contract right so i think what i want to be able to see for agencies moving forward is a better hybrid approach for doing things in a more efficient manner to where we can serve more people and be able to take that load and that stress off of our team. And to me, that's what automation does. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. Uh, so we clock our system uh, and for anybody, so whether you're a producer or a CSR, because we do have service and renewal automations, but anyone who does uh, outreach with a CRM gets an additional 2.3 uh, weeks worth of work done for Really. Them. Yeah. And so, like, you know, the amount of fall from the time that it would take you to keep up with what the CRM can do is like 2.3 weeks per month per person. Crazy. Wow. And that's, that's not talking about the benefits of the reports that it builds based off of your behavior inside of the tool, you know, all the time saving you get on that. It's like, it's, it's incomprehensible sometimes what these things can do for you. I see in the community right now, there's some uh, Facebook groups 
and one of the CRMs is been down a couple of days uh-huh. and um, people are complaining about the price. And I'm sitting here thinking they could 10 X the price right now and you would still pay it or you'd go find another CRM. But the reality is they could all 10 X our prices because we make way more money on these tools and, and help retain 10 X better than we could without them. Um, that people are looking at the appropriate reports to know that because I think sometimes we just take things at face value and especially in this, and I hate to say in this market because it's just period, right? We're all just busy. Like we're always, always busy, right? We, I mean, as soon as our doors open in the morning to the time that our doors close, and even after that, sometimes I think about all the things I didn't get done today, right? I mean, I think to me, taking that time to be able to work the reports has to be on my calendar. Like I have to be a business owner that puts it on my calendar as a priority. Do you find that people do that to even know that what they're doing is truly effective? Uh, well, I know my A players live on their calendars, you know, right. like, how do you get it all in during that, you know, throughout the day? It's like, if I'm not organized, like with my time, then it's like, things are just not going to get done. Uh, so it depends. Some of my people, like they live on their calendars. Uh, I do. Yeah. It's like, I can't get away from it. There's just no way. Um, yeah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think what I really want to encourage people to do is to be able to embrace the technological conversation, not just get such a, um, uh, uh, what, what's really the a minimalistic type idea. We need to think in a more expansive route because I think as we're seeing, um, millennials are obviously buying houses. They're well into their second house by now or whatever. You know, they've got a couple kids. They've got a kid or two, whatever. You know, now as we see kind of the Gen X coming up, they want things to be, automated to some degree, but at the same point, a lot of people are scared of automation on the business side of things. They're worried they're going to lose the personalization. How do you find that agencies are experiencing customer satisfaction that embrace technology? Like, are they getting the same quality and or better customer satisfaction and or sticky power for those clients by using automation? I would say they're getting a superior uh, satisfaction rate because, uh, you know, there's a couple experiences we're talking about here. They become a customer when we sell them. And so, yeah. you know, how do we introduce them to the agency is important and how consistent we are with that introduction is important. Right. And so if you take some of the automation out of the equation, you know, you have to do human training. You get the whole team in a huddle and you say, hey, guys, this is how we, you know, introduce people to our customers. Make sure to say these talking points. and. You know, team number one runs back to their desk and does it great. And team number two does it okay. And team number three just completely forgets four of the five things, you right, know, right. you know, and you add an automation there and it's like, now we can standardize it and we can really truly kind of indoctrinate our customers into, you know, how it, how it makes sense to work inside our organization as clients and, you know, uh, agents. Uh, and so I think it, the automation 10X enhances the experience. And then on renewal remarketing, you know, you, there's there's only so much we can do. Hey, we can look. Hey, we can't look because you, it just doesn't make sense. Or, hey, we looked and it doesn't make sense to go anywhere. Or you're being on renewed. Like, there's just so many options there. And so because, uh, you, you know, we're going to kind of say the same things, um, you know, depending on which option and path you go down in renewals, it, it, you can still keep the variety of content and messaging, I think, unique to their individual situation. I, I mean, there's only so much of a relationship that we have with our customers. It's a policy that's between us. Right. Right. And so it's expiring, it's renewing, you know, it's moving. I mean, the conversation is kind of limited to some degree. You yeah. know, the policy is not, I don't think they don't, policies don't have babies, do they? They don't, they don't grow. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> no, no, but our people do, right? Our people, we want yeah, to hey, You never know. I've been in the church for 10 years and it's like, yep, you, you never know. Dollars of a new tomorrow. That's hilarious. That's hilarious. So, so I love the fact that what you're saying though, is that there's really a policy between us and by, by using that policy and a technology to be able to deliver service and so forth to the clients. I think that what we're going to do is we're going to see that, 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 that we build that no like, and trust. We build that. We do what we say we're going to do. We communicate that it's been done. I know that for us, Sometimes our team does stuff and they forget to send a confirmation that something's been done. And all of a sudden the client asks, oh, did this ever get done? We're like, yeah, of course it got done. But sometimes we just didn't 
and do that. But that's something that whenever we close a, a item that we are working on, we can have that automatically go on out. And it builds that know, like, and trust. It builds the familiar, familiarity with our clients, keeps our name in front of them on a regular basis, and lets them know that we do what we say we're going to do. And I think for me, that is the foundation of why I need to make sure that we step up our automation is because for me, I want to automate that. So I don't have to worry about is my team remembering to send that email is my team taking care of this. I can easily go on in and we can track it. I think one of the things to, uh, you know, make it stick is like, you know, you hear people talking about like starting new diets and things like that, or like 75 hard and, you know, they're going to make a commitment to a certain period of time to do a certain activity is often kind of the back end of some of these, you know, diet, you know, these diet uh, startings. And so if you take kind of that same philosophy and you like apply it to your business and say, hey, for the next two months, we're going to have a one hour meeting uh, every every week on Tuesday. And we you know, you start to create that cadence of accountability with your team. You come together and you literally just kind of look at the tool and you train, you talk about the items in it and you clean it up. And so in the early days, this was actually also something I did for our agencies is I would be their administrator of the technology. And so I, we believe and we've proven it that it's very important to keep, you know, to use one, but not only to do that, but to keep the data just very clean, you know, keep the cards organized, like take the time to do the little things in the software. I think those are the things that are going to pay the dividends, you know, and if we're waiting a day after an interaction with the customer to update the deal, it's like, that's a poor customer experience. And so yeah. I think creating these little cadences of accountability to talk about, you know, uh, cleanliness of the app and to, you know, you know, during those conversations, sometimes you're going to talk about, you, you know, why we haven't moved a card or the reason we did move a card. And that opens up a conversation to train on like sales in general or service in general or retention in general inside the organization, but it's built around the cleaning of the, of the pipelines. And so if you don't do like pipeline cleanup weekly, it's like, oh, yeah, uh, sticky. yeah, got to got to got to dust and sweep every once in a while. That's, oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. I love that. So it's not just about subscribing to somebody like Lava or some other system to be able to say, hey, make this happen. It's also being accountable to make sure that you maintain it down the road. Because I know clean data is something. So let me ask you a question. What is the, and I think I, think I know it's a very low number, but what is the percentage of agencies that either have clean data or think their data is clean? Oh gosh, I wouldn't even know. Um... Because I'm going to say, know, the, low. I don't think anybody really thinks that they have clean data or even expects their data to be clean at this point. Like, yeah, true, yeah, true, I'm sure there's, you know, there's like, you, like, so like when we download like book of businesses to like load them into the CRM, for mm -hmm. example, there's like five phone number fields and you'll, you'll get a lot of people use phone one, two, three, four, and five. And it's like, the numbers can be the same in all the fields. They could be different in all the fields on yeah. this account. And it's like, that's where we see kind of like the messy data is sometimes in the AMS fields. But as far as like the CRM goes, it's pretty easy. They're usually flexible enough. They allow you to like merge contacts and things of that nature. And they're really clear about having like, you know, just a, you know, one or two phone fields kind of as a standard, not 15. And uh, I don't know. So the data is going to be close enough. But what we do see the agencies want to strive to do is to keep their opportunities because that is the relationship, right? The policy is the opportunity keeping those organized and where they're at in the customer journey keeps the stress off their back the most. I mean, if you get a phone number wrong, you, know, you can adjust it. Right. You right. can start getting that, uh, the, the automated communication wrong, you're going to feel it. And I think agencies, I think that's sometimes the apprehension that they have is to getting started with automation is, oh man, I don't want to get a negative complaint. Yeah. And I'll tell you right now, you're going to get a bunch. Awesome. You should look forward to it. You're going to grow through that. And, um, uh, you'll find that it is a fraction of the positive responses that you get from it. Mm. And so we see that that's usually like a big apprehension. Like, oh man, I just, I, what if the automation did get someone to say something bad? Awesome. It happens all the time. Guess what? No big deal. You're going to have so much more people say how awesome it is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's a just concept like, that some people struggle with. It's just like somebody, I read, uh, <clears throat> I read a book one time and it said, you know, what if you go on out and you put a product out on Amazon, right? And you, and you uh, say you write a book, right? You put, you put it out on Amazon 
and you get three people who complain about the book, who don't like the book, right? You're going to focus on those three people way yeah. more than the 400 yeah. people that gave it a five-star review and said it was a book that changed their life. We don't read those positives sometimes. We only read those three negative that came on in and said, oh, this is the most stupid book I ever read, right? So I think even as agency owners, we need to make sure that we focus in on the, you know, the scope, right? Let's read those positives and let's take those into consideration their negatives. And sometimes we need to take into consideration those negatives. Somebody was just having a bad day and they just got cranky yeah. somewhere. Sometimes they're not even customers. Sometimes we can track them down and they weren't even people that were even our pipeline. You know, that might that, that's the weirdest. Somewhere. That is the weirdest. But you see that stuff sometimes. Huh? Like, you do, what? you do. <laughs> and I think we have to take it all kind of with a grain of salt. And I think whenever we adopt something new like automation or make changes to our automation, we need to understand that some of these things are just going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, um that's always a good one when some of those weird ones come through. It's like, yeah. what? How can, how can we leave us no feedback? Yeah, yeah. So the same guy, Mark, that we went from like one to seven on, you know, when and we kind of got started in the process, he had like 200 reviews. And then uh, I think like today's like over 1,700. So people wow. love you. Like, you know, if you really take care of them, if you do the, when you have the interaction, if you're demonstrating your license, they're going to love you, right? Like if you're using the tools that you have at your disposal, yeah. which is your education, like customers are going to be thrilled to work with you. And so, so you need just to just automate the parts that don't require that level of like uh, sophistication. Do you find team members are pretty open to automation? Like, do you find that they're more open to automation or do you feel like that the, the leadership has to drag them into it? Producers are way more open to it than CSR. CSRs okay. love to suspense inside of uh, the AMS. And it usually takes a long time to get uh, CSRs pumped about uh, the automation. And I've seen that probably in 50 out of the 86 agencies that we've set up. Okay. Um, and so, but once you can, and sometimes it takes, you know, three months, sometimes it takes a year, but when they, when it clicks for them, like that, you can't turn them off and they usually become like the creators of, of like new ideas and things to automate once they fall in love with it, where producers, once they get their set, like, don't talk to them, you know, <laughs> <laughs> they're, not, they're, they're just, easy. You can turn that there's on like in a day. Yeah. And they're just like, leave me alone. It works good enough. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, CSRs, once they fall in love with it, it's like, oh man, can we do notice of cancellations? Can we do underwriter stuff? And it's like, yeah, you can do all of these cool things on it. You know, can it do your renewals? Absolutely. Commercial versus personal. It's like, it, it saves you a ton of time in yeah. service. I love it. But, you know, you have this idea of wanting to maintain your AMS, which is always kind of the burden throughout it. And so some of the CRMs have, you know, two way integration to be able to leave notes and create policies and things like that. It's really kind of cleaned it up. Uh, the experience, but there's sometimes there's still the burden to maintain two systems independently a little bit. And right. So even our OG agencies that were built out on keep that can't leave because their build is so kind of like personalized, um, you know, they have this burden of permanently maintaining the AMS separate from the CRM, but they get so much benefit out of the CRM that they would never not do this. Yeah. And yeah. so like people often have to wrap their head around what that's pretty powerful. You think about it. Like, I would I would go so far to do double data entry in two systems because the benefit is there versus not having one of them because it won't talk to the main system and we'd have to do double data, you know, like we don't want to do that double data entry. Right. right? So the, the benefit far outweighs the consequence. And that's the other thing, you know, when you're doing with automation, sometimes, you know, the benefit is, you know, 99 to one and sometimes it's 60 to one, but still we try and solve for the majority, I think is the default. Like, how do we knock the biggest chunk of tasks off of your plate at any given time? Yeah. yeah. You know, the kind of philosophy that we try to teach people to look at, like when they're working on that stuff. Anyways, we geeked out hard today. Got it. Got into the weeds on some automation. I love it. I uh, love it. So, but I do want to also ask you real quick, what do you see as the future? Because I think we have to look forward. I don't think it's just what everybody else is doing or what the cool kids are doing. What yeah. do you what do you think we're going to be in, embracing? And just real fast, just what do you think we're going to be embracing in the future for automation? Like, what is kind of the next steps? Well, so I always been saying, and I, you know, we did this not repeated much really out there. I don't think that we should be embracing a whole lot. I think we need to get the first kind of like big chunk of this bolted down, and right. then stop looking at new tech for six months. If if you just made like a technology, like leap in your agency, you know, and you, and you fast forwarded, you know, a year because you came through an agency like ours, or you just spent a lot of time building it, whatever the case may be, like stay there. <laughs> but it's settled, you yeah. just made this massive improvement. By the time there's some like other major massive improvement out there, 
Uh, it's going to take years to get vetted out. But meanwhile, you just took this big like technology leap, like stay there, block and tackle, find a way to maximize this new like uh, foundation of your organization. And then, you know, let someone else go be the the pioneer on that new tech. And then, you know, when it comes out, it will hit like a wave. It always does. Technology is not something that gets like away in some corner that people don't share. It's like people can't wait to share their technology yeah. when it comes out because they want to sell it. Right. Yep. Um, and so we want someone else pioneer. Anyways, we see a lot of stuff with like chat GPT is so buzzy. I cannot find a way to get it into my business in a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. I can't, I don't think people yeah. are saying this, honestly, <laughs> uh, but I do think it's coming. We've looked I at it and there's right like now. some, there's like some potential, uh, it has the potential to do some really sophisticated stuff. If you can find the right programmers, I think yeah. that can kind of connect the parts of like it looking at your data, you giving it a query where you tell it to, you know, update your, you know, content in theory, uh, and then go put it back into the campaigns and improve your content in real time based off of conversions. Ooh, that would be super cool. Right. And it's just, it's just working on the content based off conversions, but like to get all those pieces connected to make it do these things seems like, sure, that sounds awesome, but who's going to spend the money on that? You know, True. Um, True. that's mine in case anybody wants to uh, trademark that right now. Right. I'll say you need to start filling out your paperwork yeah. with the government on that one real quick. Yeah, I've seen some other like little, you know, use cases uh, for, you know, like if you're trying to, like, if you're struggling to write content and you're, and you're comfortable with the prompts that you can put into chat GPT, like it'll pound out emails in like five seconds. But yeah. um, I mean, I just haven't seen much for it. Okay. So I just think everybody right now, like in the country, like if you have a CRM and, you know, maybe you've got some internal forms or something like that, you know, depending on if you're an applied or vertifor, uh, I do love the internal forms for India with applying so they sync the AMS. But if you're on, you know, Vertifor or like Hawksoft or something like that, and you're using something like Cognito or Jot, like use these forms, connect them into your CRM, you know, store that data. Don't put things on pen and paper. Right. And, um, right. You and streamline and, and that is going to get you through the next five years of this, you know, insurance Love industry. Yeah. Love it. Well, Austin, I know you have a large team. You work with VAs. You help people out with their systems or automations. You help them out with all of these different pieces, and you have a team to do that. If people want to work with Lava, how can they go ahead and do that? Yeah, just come to our website, www.lavaautomation.com, uh, and fill out one of our Book Now forms and jump on a call with uh, someone from our office and kind of explore what you can do. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell everybody we are we are in the process of doing lava. We actually go live next week, Friday, a week from today. So I'm super excited about that. We we played around with the with the with the agency Zoom thing on our own kind of thing for a couple of months. So my team knows about it. Like they 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 understand kind of the concepts. It's not going to be you know cold turkey for us. But at the same point, I'm super excited and um, everything I've loved seeing from y'all's team. Just to let you know, has been wonderful. So. Oh, um, I have really enjoyed you said so. with, uh, with my guy who helps me on out and, you know, he, he's very um, good about asking great questions. He's good about and making great suggestions. And um, I've been very, very happy with Lava. So that's why I was like, I want to put you on the podcast so that people can hear about automation done. Oh, you're so sweet. So, uh, so just make sure to, you know, uh, ask them for anything. I always tell people that like, you know, bother us before, you know, you don't. So yeah, just get, get, get the service you want. He'll Those are your, you. probably your, you know, people on the way to being your A clients, right? Or people that ask questions, people that want more, people that are get really involved in it. So I absolutely love it. So thank you so much. Thank Austin, you. Thanks for having you me. You are always one of my favorite people. If you are in Dallas, let me know anytime and I'll take you out for dinner. I know you're always busy whenever you go places, but always let me know. I'm always around. Thanks, Teresa. All right, everybody, this has been another awesome, amazing episode of the Power Women in Insurance podcast. Today, we have Austin Moorhead with Lava. If you are a Lava Automation, if you are looking specifically for automation in your agency, if you want to talk about it, they have a lot of great done for you type uh, pipelines and concepts. They can walk you through what it is you're thinking of and how you can get the most out of your automation as well. So make sure you reach out to Lava Automation and check out another amazing episode of the Power Women in Insurance podcast where we bring actionable traits, actionable activities to you to be able to implement inside your agency at any time. Everybody, I'll talk to you next week. Have a good one.